what people are not understanding is that the next phase of globalization, globalization 4.0, is not simply platform work through screens, but will include haptic robotics, remote robotic work, and also avatar work, <laughs> like that your avatar will go, it won't necessarily even be you going to do the gig work and that this is all going to run on blockchain and you will have a digital identity, your digital blockchain wallet will be the portal that links your digital twin, whether that is your digital humanoid robot or your digital avatar to your material self. Welcome to the Kempe Podcast. My name is Mikko Kempe and the whole intention of this podcast is for me to try to get inside different fascinating mind so that we can discover together their unique perspective on life. Welcome, let's start. On the Kemper podcast this time, I have the great pleasure to have as a guest, Alison McDowell. First of all, welcome to the Kemper podcast. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, as far as I understand, you're an independent researcher, you're the host of a popular blog, Friends in the Gears, and you have researched a lot about artificial intelligence, this idea of singularity, cybernetics, wearable tech, and, uh, and probably also biohacking, which I'm, I'm super interested in myself. And, and you have talked, I guess, a lot about potential dangers and maybe some challenges that this kind of race uh, I think you use this term planetary computer that some people are wanting to, I guess, uh, build, uh, have. So you have talked about this potential, maybe dangerous, but are, are you just one of these kind of persons who are against technology and you are just, uh, just thinking that it's all bad? Well, I guess it depends on what we call technology, right? <laughs> I mean, in the, in the end, like, what is, what is technology? Technology mm. can be your hands, right? Or technology. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there's larger conversations around, um, like, it, like, larger ethical conversations around interrogating both the nature of the universe and our place in it. And to me, it feels like much of the technology that we talk about today is around like electrical engineering and systems engineering. And that for the most part, the people who are involved in these spaces do not have um, the access to knowledge and the shared understanding of technology as an engineering system and who holds the power in these systems um, is not clearly understood. And it's not necessarily contextualized in terms of um, its military origins. A lot of the cloud computing systems and the cybernetic systems are directly connected to uh, weapons, weapon systems. I mean, it always has been about weapon systems. And so it's, it's very cool when it gets dressed up as a game or as, you know, a digital currency system or as a media system. But if we're not equally surfacing the origins and understanding as a command and control system and a system that ultimately is, tends to be top down, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we're living in this moment of incredible disparities around wealth and power. And we understand that the people, if we're talking about potentially a planetary computer or a full on social systems engineering at a global scale, perhaps even in a cosmic scale, um, and that no one is, is necessarily having the full information to consent to a, a transformation, then to me, like, those are the questions that I want to look into. Because if in the end game, everyone has access to all of the information and all of the historic context, um, and then we collectively decide um, to do something, that is very different than a small group of people who have access to knowledge that is not commonly understood making decisions that will likely further empower a small group of global sociopathic billionaires. And so that's sort of where I'm coming from. Like, I'm not here to tell you how to think about it, but I'm here to say like, let us unpack all of the stuff and put it on the table and make sure everybody is fully informed before we, we go forth with, um, you know, remaking ourselves or, or the, the beings with whom we share a planet into computing, like man-directed computing systems, which in, in some respects, they're already natural computing systems uh, connected to a, a, a larger non-militarized apparatus, but then do we want to inject the militarization context into all of it? So that's, that's sort of where I come from on it. And Sasha, Yasha Levine's book, Surveillance Valley, um, which is, you know, many people talk about Shoshana Zuboff 
surveillance capitalism, but at the end of the day, she's a Harvard, you know, well, former emeritus Harvard Business School professor. So like how much, uh, you know, liberation is going to come out of Harvard Business School, right? How much spin, what isn't being said. And for me, a, a useful complement to that is Surveillance Valley, which is the military history of the internet. Um, so if you, you understand that, that's, I, I think that's a, you need to read those two together. Yeah, that's actually was my question. I've heard, I don't, I haven't researched this, but I heard that some people say that the internet was built by, was it DARPA or some US yeah, military? ARPA. At that point it was the ARPA, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and so, but, uh, but you could say, well, haven't they done a lot of good by building the internet? Well, I guess it depends. So this is so Stephen Newcomb is um, an uh, independent indigenous scholar who has done a lot of work around um, interrogating like systems of domination and empire, right, especially as it pertains to the original people of Turtle Island. But for me, I feel like what is unfolding now in terms of a rising global biosecurity state that's tied to a systems engineering process that is a direct extension of the imperial domination that came under the papal bulls in this age of exploration and um, uh, empire really of, of much of the world. And so there's, there's a connection there to that. And so what he speaks of is interrogating the actual words and the Latin documents of these papal bulls and the idea of domination and do dom, like a dome that, that, that um, you know, I'm in Philadelphia, I'm based in Philadelphia, so, you know, we've just had July 4th and like the Liberty Bell, and in some ways, the Liberty Bell is the dome, right? And so if for the original people, when the conquering parties came, they would say, well, if you can accommodate yourself to living as an imperial citizen, then we will give you some rights and privileges, right? But we decide, we've made the dome, we will put you in our dome, and in that dome, you can do some things. You can't do all of the things. You can't do the things outside the dome that you used to do because your cultural practice, that's got to go away. But if you agree to live in the dome, in the dom, freedom, if you live to live in freedom, then we will allow you to exist. And then if you don't so much like our dome, then we will wipe you off the planet. And that's sort of the, 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 the pursuant element of this. So if we understand that these technologies as an extension of this domination, if we are willing to live under a cybernetic empire, right? Like if we agree that um, a future of militarized um, computing systems in which we become collective biocomputers to run the matrix, you know, which is sort of what they're talking about with this internet of bio nano things, um, then we can do some things in this empire. We could live as an avatar. We can have things in video games. We can own lots of shit, you know, in, in online communities. We can do cool things, but it's things that someone else, that Google or someone has just allowed us to have these freedoms in their dome. But we're in Google's box. We're in the military's box. We're in the box. And a lot of people, it's kind of like the movie, The Truman Show, the, that, that, it wasn't until they got to the edge and started poking that they're like, oh, there, this horizon stops. There's a stopping point. And so like my framing is that vulnerable communities, oppressed communities, they're a lot closer to the edge of the dome and they're more likely to understand that the dome exists, right? That our democracy exists within these limitations. Within, it's about a mental construct of what is allowed. Um, the people of privilege who are living in the middle of the dome and they can't really see any of the edges, they may have no clue that the dome is even there. And so my sense is in right now in the technological space, for the most part, people are very brilliant. Like there are many beautiful and brilliant minds who love the math, who love the physics, who love the ideas, but are not their um, uh, success and reinforcement mechanism is not built into what are the ethical implications, what are the social implications, what are implications for faith and sacred practice and beings beyond humans as they spin out their equations and ideas and concepts of like nanoelectronics. Um, did they have a certain mind that is built for a certain purpose that they're very good at? But if we, we've moved into a society that is very narrow very narrow and so people are not looking wide and what I do is look wide and go okay if, if we do remake the world as a planetary computer and we know legacy of domination and how that went for original people then maybe we should slow down before we we 
we do all these things before we, we coat everything in graphene, you know, maybe we should wait. So anyway, that's sort of my perspective. Yeah, that, that, that brings us back a uh, few, few different questions. Before I go to the questions, I just want to clarify, I guess you're not meaning uh, that you are a flat earth believer by talking about the dome and the Truman Show, right? This is a joke. No, but it's, <laughs> but, a, it's structure. It's a conceptual structure, right? That if you live, if you agree to live under the conditions of empire, um, then you will, you will be treated in a certain way. And if you say, I reject the empire, I, I do not, I have a different way of being that is separate from the empire, then at that point you become an existential threat and must be eliminated. And I, I think that's increasingly where we're moving to, um, yeah, if, if there are some concepts around a planetary computer in which everything becomes attached to a larger system and where your DNA is reduced to a computing mechanism, um, I would suspect that there are going to be groups of people if they understood, fully con understood what that meant would um, not want to be under that system. And, and, and so for right now, the conversation is limited so that we don't have those conversations. Yeah, I think if I understand what you're saying is that basically if we go back in history, those people who have had technological power or basically colonized and come with the guns, oftentimes it has not uh, gone so well with the indigenous people. And if we understand that history, if, if the power and technological power is in, in, in few hands, I guess what you're saying is that, that there is potential dangers and threats, right? Right. Well, it is a new system, right? Mm -hmm. So on, on the continent of, you know, North America, the Latin America, you know, that there were highly developed communities that were living um, with their own technologies mm -hmm. um, on land and working in environmental systems for thousands of years that predated um, Western elements coming onto that space, right? And then when that came and what evolved as this manifest destiny was an idea that that system needed to be fundamentally replaced by a different economic system, a different cultural system, a different system in relation to the environment. And so they could not, co they did not coexist. The, the system that came was not willing to coexist with the existing system and then what came of that was a cultural erasure, both um, overt in terms of um, death, a cultural erasure, which was tied to, um, you know, making uh, faith practices illegal, removing children from families, introducing, um, you know, syst like economic dispossession, uh, removal systems to make that culture's fabric completely fall apart. And I, I recently gave a talk in, in Arizona, which was the site of an engagement where the Apache for 30 years were engaged in the US military in sort of asymmetrical warfare mm -hmm. to preserve their way of being on their lands. And, and so that engagement unfolded. And interestingly enough, um, the, the US military presence, it was the, um, the Buffalo soldiers. So it was the black soldiers. Who do, you, who do you wanna send to the desert and fight the Apache? Well, you send the black soldiers there, right? Of course. Um, so then the evolution of this, this military base that dated to the 1870s became the center of, it's Fort Huachuca, and it's the center of electronic warfare. It's the center of electronic warfare. Mm -hmm. Still, so there is, a, there is a historical legacy and that's what I bring, that's why I attempt to bring is if we understand as a legacy system, it's not surprising that Fort Huachuca is linked to Aberdeen Proving Ground and is involved in, in electronic warfare because the new empire is digital. The new empire lives in the cloud and is a digital empire, but it's a military empire. And that's for the, to a certain extent, I think many people operating in this space, um, maybe not the people operating in the space because my understanding is many people who are operating, there's a quarter of a revolving door between the military and um, electronics, defense contractors, gamers, um, that there is quite a bit of overlap. And so I think people who are insiders in the space know that, but I think a lot of people who are using the products are, do not come into the products because they're so attractive and they work so well and, and they feed into the needs that we perceive we have that they don't really question where it came from, right? And so, um, 
And of course, that's how you want to do it, because if you have an empire, you don't particularly want to engage in outright warfare. You'd rather people actually ask to be imperial subjects, right? You'd rather them actually come into it in their agreement, because you waste a lot less resources that way. Well, I lived in Louisiana, and I, I, I remember uh, reading about some kind of slave owner at the time who consulted some kind of psychologist from Germany, and they he, he came to the realization that the best type of slaves are those who don't realize they are slaves. Uh, so yes. I, I, guess, I guess that's, that's kind of what you're, what you're saying here. But can you expand maybe in kind of simple terms or how would you begin even to unpack this idea of like a military empire and who would be behind it? Uh, you mentioned uh, some globalist uh, psychopaths, if I remember right in the beginning here. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, uh, but how would you, in simple terms, try to explain, let's say, somebody who is not familiar with this type of ideas at all, like, what, what is it that you mean? Well, okay. So, I, when you say the who, um, so I think in many respects there are individuals, um, even in the alternative media, who are fronts for larger systems. What we're talking about is a structure of which there are sort of leading characters who um, embody um, these systems, like the Gateses and the Klaus Schwabs and different people who I'm not saying are good people and they're certainly doing terrible things, but it's not just them. They are front man for a larger system behind. And so a lot of people would say like, well, it's too big to track. I don't know what this tracking system is. Um, okay, let me back up. All right, before I go there. So I will say, if you understand the imperative of capital is growth. Like the capital system demands an ongoing economic growth. In the same way, the last global economic crash in 2008, they said, go out and still buy things. Because if, ever, if the system stopped, it's sort of the Ponzi scheme, it would all fall apart. So there's this perception of continued growth. And the logic of it is if you live on a planet of finite resources, material resources, right? Not elect necessarily electronic or particle resources, but physical material resources as we currently understand them. Um, how do you continue to grow global economies without fully compromising the planet we're, we're sitting on, right? So there's, there's a tension there. Like how, and then in addition to the physical limitations, now you've got incredible wealth inequality so the idea of consumer spending becomes impossible because the poor are in debt and they can't nearly buy all the things in terms of goods and services that you need to sell them to grow the economy. They just don't have it. And they're, they're maxed out on their debt. And the people who have the resources are the ones who just want more resources and they're very limited number. So the system starts to get wonky and you need a new system. And so my theory of how the system works is that they are going to create the metaverse. And you can actually see the messaging happen, happening now. I, I shared a, an, a, a media, or it was like an op-ed um, for someone who works with Mark Andreessen, uh, where they were talking about reality privilege. And so they're, they're, they're setting up the narrative that the metaverse will offer you all of the things. The metaverse will solve inequality. In the metaverse, you can have your deepest desires you know, met. You can connect globally, you can enrich your mind with all, you know, which is in some extent true because, you know, I have had these collaborations with people through digital, you know, so that's not all, it's, I'm not saying it's not all true, but they're, they're pitching the metaverse and they're not talking about it as a military space, as the solution to the environmental problems, to the social problems, to the economic problems. If you live in the metaverse, you can have stuff, you can have ostensibly- Can you, can you stop and say, say, can you explain what is a metaverse? Like a virtual reality? The metaverse is a digital realm, right? It is a digital world. I mean, we're somewhat living in different parts of the metaverse. Like right now, we're through Zoom. This is an electronic communication that will go be stored somewhere. And that's like a digital replica of the real world. Mm -hmm. Like we're somewhat, it's like a bridge. But the gaming world and the video game industry is central to this, mm -hmm. to the new version of Empire. And that's connected with the Entertainment Software Association, it's connected with Microsoft, 
it's connected with this idea of that you would have a digital twin. Like the movie, kind of like the kind of like the movie Player One or Avatar Ready, or much, something. Yeah. yeah, Ready Player One. I think there's a movie of like the surrogates. So mm. there, there, that you would have a digital twin. Those digital twins could manifest either through a humanoid robot, which is being pursued now by I think like Sanctuary AI. They talk about it. They there was Singularity University was in. Denmark, they were hosting this woman from Sanctuary AI saying, oh, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a digital, uh, not a digital, I'm gonna have a humanoid robot twin and I'm gonna be in a haptic suit and I'm gonna win VR headsets. I'm gonna, we'll train my twin. I will, my consciousness will be invested in a robot. So that's one kind. Um, the other is that you will have a virtual avatar and there's actually something called Ready Player Me, readyplayer.me that is based out of Estonia and they're being funded by the EU. And they say, okay, so now we've, we've done, we have this whole data set of, um, we had these pods and you would go in and you would get a 360 image and we have tens of thousands of these we've collected. And now from all the machine learning that we've done on these data sets, you, even though you don't have to go in a pod, can take a selfie and we will recreate you as an avatar. And we actually have a system that will reshape your avatar um, to work in whatever digital realm you're in, which I'm not a gamer, but my understanding is that the aesthetic differs depending on what gaming environment you're in. You know, you're blockier, you're more realistic, you're less realistic, that, that once you have the parameters, they will reshape you to fit in that digital world, right? Whether that world is Minecraft or that is World of Warcraft or Fortnite or these, they will, you, they've got your data points and they can say, whoo, 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 okay, like we, Allison, we'll put, you wanna go in this place? Okay, we'll put your avatar here. And they specifically talk about avatars that you will connect with emotionally and love. And what people are not understanding is that the next phase of globalization, globalization 4.0, is not simply um, platform work through screens, but will include haptic robotics, remote robotic work, and also avatar work, <laughs> like that your avatar will go, it won't necessarily even be you going to do the gig work, and that this is all going to run on blockchain, and you will have a digital identity, your digital blockchain wallet will be the portal that links your digital twin, whether that is your digital humanoid robot or your digital avatar, to your material self. And this data flow, um, the things you create, the things that you own, your emotions, your badges, your social credit will flow through this portal, which is they frame it as a blockchain wallet. Right now they're framing it as crypto, but it's not going to be just crypto. It's this, this holding space of interoperable data assets, which is what blockchain was meant for, for capital to go digital, will hold all of that. And it will, in holding it, it will be private but then you will be forced to unlock data to access things, right? If you, do you want this gig job? Well, you have to open your wallet and let us know what your social credit score is so we can trust you. You know, you want to, you want to go to this concert, you want to do these things, even as an avatar, they can force you to say, well, unlock this data to prove that you can do the thing that you're asking. And in the metaverse, they've talked about this also as the spatial web, web 3.0. So the spatial web exists in different, online spaces so you can picture like Facebook rooms or different virtual reality spaces, some of which will be again connected potentially remotely through haptics to robots wherever they're physically, some may strictly be avatars and that um, you know your avatar can like earn tokens or credits for you right mm -hmm. and then it will go to your combined wallet right you're, like you'll have a collective of you know beingness that's mostly like increasingly digital that is working or not on your behalf. Um, and this is all coming through like uh, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone. They have this Japan Moonshot Project, this uh, uh, Japan Science and Technology Agency. They have a moonshot program. They had a conference in December, 2019. Their paper, their first goal that says by 2050, their intention is that we will live outside of a physical mind and body in time and space. So we're getting here and it's coming through gaming. Um, it's coming and, and no one's framing that as an empire. Like I, I got a second strike on my YouTube channel. And so I'm mm. trying to find places. I don't want it to be blockchain, some other space to hold my, my online content, which is not monetized. I just want to put it out for people. And someone said, well, maybe Twitch. And I'm not a gamer. I didn't really know what Twitch was. So, you know, it's owned by Amazon. So again, 
problematic, but it's everyone streaming their video game lives, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you understand that we're in, I think what John Trudell, who is an American Indian activist who, who's passed on, but he describes it as a predator energy, a predator energy that would mind the being part of human, right? And he was framing it from an indigenous standpoint. But at this point, my framing is that artificial intelligence or generalized artificial intelligence is that predator energy and the cultural erasure the way the original people experienced it is actually now all of natural life all of natural life that is not inter, inter integrated through synthetic biology or digital computational systems into the computer that must be erased because the new system cannot tolerate the outliers and so we're in this this moment we're in this in this in-between moment so they will sell the digital empire as a game they will sell it as remote work how convenient it is to be able to do remote work from anywhere not saying that there is no labor protection that these online spaces like roblox um have child predators that this is a militarized system in which ai and programmers can use feedback loops to trigger dopamine or not and that the amount of behavioral data analytics that is collected on you in online spaces is tremendous and beyond what anybody can fully appreciate beyond your facial recognition even you know your pulse rate like by blinking light off of the back of your retina your eyeball like they get they get all of this information and so it's like a vampiric system that is feeding your self your material self projected through robots and avatars into the ai for machine learning and it's it's and to create your replacement we're training our replacements i think is essentially but it's fun and it feels cool and whatever so people are like eh, like i that figure that's down the road that that replacement program like i'm maybe i'll be dead by then but wow well there's so many questions <laughs> that comes yeah. comes to my mind from, I mean, from... A lot. yeah yeah, that's a, that's a lot. I mean, uh, f first of all, I mean, I just kind of for everybody to maybe get a like some kind of image. Uh, I, I, I to what came to my mind with like haptic robots. I think I saw some kind of video where person was virtually kind of like stocking some shelf or uh, with yeah, some some like some it. some bottles and and they were in a different place, but they were basically controlling a robot that was doing the kind of physical labor work for them. That's the kind of right. image that came came to my mind. Just so, so people can kind of like hang on to some image, uh, but then then comes to. I mean, also in Japan, they they framed it because they're very careful about how the narrative goes, right? Mm. And all of this is dual use, so they don't present the counterpoint, but they'll say, "Oh, well, look, there are people who have um, physical limitations who mm. are bedridden with ALS, or you know, and look now they can live through a robot." But what it is was that this person in a hospital bed or this person who is con physically limited to a very limited physical existence was working in a cafe. So if you understand welfare reform and welfare to work, are they giving this person, these the people who have these limitations, the rights to live a full life? Or are they plugging them into a, a, a predatory gig economy? right is the idea that you're renting your space in the hospital bed by your robot remote working in a cafe in tokyo and you know you know do what is dignity there right is it it they would like for you to believe that that is that is you know something that addresses um you know justice right but if it's well you haven't worked your you know 10 hours at the cafe today you know and paid off your debt to the hospital it's a very different thing than saying like here let, let's make sure everybody's needs are met and by the way, then you can find fulfillment in work of your choice. Oh my God, that's, that that would go into another another continue, not 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 a, not a road. I, like, I will go there. I will, right, go, I, I will go there just a little bit. Uh, anyway, I mean, what comes to my mind is in this kind of world of uh, biohacking, biohacking and transhumanism. This idea that I thought. Like you already have this kind of bionic arm that can be stronger than your kind of normal physical arm. Or there was this, I think it was a German or some uh, long jumper who was in the Paralympics, but jumped longer than anybody in the normal Olympics because he had this kind of bionic leg. And that, that, that already 
uh, like a long time ago, started raising some questions that, wait a second, will humans at some point, in order to have a competitive advantage, start to replace their human parts with some kind of, some kind of technology just in order to kind of uh, uh, stay ahead of some kind of progress? Uh, but but we don't have but we don't have to go there. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to ask you, because there are some people who would argue maybe that that well, we as humans we always throughout history we've developed technology. I mean, you wear eyeglasses. That was a part of technology, and 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 it's just a, it's just a natural involvement of us humans. Uh, developing things to get better and better and so it's kind of innate in a way that that uh, some people would call this uh, just that we are technologically determined to create a like a better version of ourselves, and it's just nature in that sense and then there are some people maybe like uh, comes to mind like a Terrace McKenna who would probably say that Nobody has any control. Nobody knows what's going on. It's all just a random thing. So just go with it. Why, why try to figure it out? And then you are saying that there is some kind of predatorial kind of evil, I would say, energy. And if that's the case, uh, I, I, it would come to mind, of course, to ask, like, where does that kind of predatorial evil energy come from or intention? And what do you think of those two other options or theories? Um. Well, on, on the one side, on the technology. So I would say what we're living through right now in the past year is the culmination of at least 60 plus years of like electronic communications, cybernetic systems theory planning that is now interfacing with environmental restructuring at a foundational level, including our atmosphere and all of, all of the things that we encounter. Like if you look up the internet of bio nano things, Ian Achilles at Georgia Tech, like, and this Moonshot Project, they are literally um, looking to remake what life is through electrical systems, okay? And this, is, this has been happening in changes to the atmosphere. This is happening in terms of frequency, um, infrastructure that is being put in. Um, opt optical uh, lighting systems that are being put in. If you if you actually spend some time digging into what's happening in uh, the nanotechnology and the biotechnology spaces and what is happening, I know this past week there's been a lot more awareness around graphene and the the uh, discovery ostensibly of this two dimensional material to create the the nano electronics that was I think 2004 ish um, and and these changes. The general population is not in any way aware of the scientific advances that are happening and that they are often they are happening not with a collective understanding of the potential peril of, of what that means because we are electrical beings we are water-based beings i'm in you know philadelphia the university of pennsylvania is central to a lot of this 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 program and they're talking about nanotechnology in the water cycle, right? Nanotechnology in the soil. Well, uh, DuPont is working um, in, in you know, bio nanotech in the microbiome, in your gut. Now, would we want DuPont, knowing their past history of environmental contamination, their past history in, um, you know, 18th century weapons <laughs> manufacturing in their bad corporate behavior ongoing to then incorporate their technologies into us in this very intimate way and into our environmental system. Um, is anyone talking about nanotechnology in the water cycle or what it means knowing that, you know, there's a 1996 US Air Force report talking about information dominance and electrical dominance and dominance of space in the atmosphere as the future of warfare in 1996 and saying, well, how does that all fit into what we're doing now in bio nanotech and uh, the biosecurity state, right? So, so when you say, when people are like, well, it's just a natural evolution. And I would say, well, we, I can't try to counterpoint, like the counterpose this about humans dominating nature. That is the scientist view, which is, I believe, a Western, more of a Western view that man is above all other things. And, and someone whose work I really respect um, 
and gives me a lot of inspiration and makes me feel better about this stuff. Her name is Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she's a professor of forestry at, well, at the SUNY State University of New York Forestry School, and her specialty is moss. And she's citizen Potawatomi Nation, she's indigenous. And she speaks of the fact that humans, we're the younger beings, we're the younger siblings in all of this. Like we're in this world where time is very different for her. Um, the moss, like moss can take, you know, decades to evolve, this tiny bit of moss. And, and these forests of moss at the, the microscopic scale, these like little lions and water beingness, like at that scale, we don't live at the moss scale. We live at the people scale and most of us are oblivious to the moss scale, right? We're not thinking about the boulders. Um, there are things that we are supposed to learn from the other beings and for the last several hundreds of years a certain worldview has conditioned us the domination principle that we know all of the things right and and then and then we have this hubris and then we we have systems of meritocracy that reward compliant behavior to all of the things okay these are the things we believe we are going to teach you to believe them too and then we will reinforce and credit you for believing them and restating them and then quoting all of the people behind. So you end up at this progression where your knowledge may be deep, but it's really rather narrow because it essentially excludes um, many other knowledges that are deemed invalid, right? It, like indigenous ways of being. And so for me, what, what, what Dr. Kimmerer speaks of is also reciprocity. We have to learn from the other beings and we are part of webs of relationships. So if you imagine as a counterpoint to the internet, um, they've talked about the wood wide web, you know, the, the electrochemical signals of tree roots and My fungi. Soul. And yeah. yeah, that there are electrical systems that are out there that are not ours. Like we did not make these things and yet they exist and they, could you consider them a technology? Are they a sacred, to me that is a sacred other electric system, right? And so, and a lot of what we try to create is a mere lesser mirror of the things that is, are already in this natural creation. So, um, you know, people win by telling the story they, the way they want to tell it and putting the parameters and saying see we've always just been technology and that's just the way it is but i would say no i don't know i think there are other ways you could tell this story um and so i guess that would what i would be about the technology and and the randomness um i have tried to learn unlearn over this past year i i was you know I was good in school. <laughs> like, I mean, it's ironic. Like I, and I, now I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I was programming. It literally is programming. Um, and I've had to unlearn a lot of that. And you have to try to detach your identity from the reward systems because a lot of the cybernetic systems engineering is behaviorist. It's reinforcement, it's feedback loops now run by AI. So I've had to like back out of a lot of this stuff and be like, hmm, okay, well, how, how much do I have to unlearn to, open up to learning other things and trusting not having the plan, right? I always like, what's the plan? What's, I mean, I wasn't like when I was in school, they didn't have rubrics, but you know, it wasn't like, I wasn't a grade grubber really, but like, you always want to know, okay, what's a success look like? You know, what am I aiming for? How do I get that? Like, there's something on the horizon and that's how we're conditioned in the West to do it. Like, okay, there are these steps and what's the plan? What's the timing? the past year and a half, it's like out the window. Because guess what? We're not in control of all the things. I can't control DARPA. I can't control Goldman Sachs. I can't control SoftBank or, you know, the Cardano people. I, there are many things I have no control over. So, but I can control myself and I can try to engage in the world in ways that if I have stillness and if I listen, um, maybe it will communicate with me. And maybe I need to listen to other ways that are not outside myself about this. And so I don't know if you've seen any of my stuff about the dandelions, but yeah, I, 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 work, bit, yeah. I work in a, a garden, a part-time, I'm not a horticulturalist, I have a desk job, but I've been, and you know, this spring, I just had this feeling about the dandelion. There's something about the dandelion because I feel like in, in facing off against this dominating prospect, like, we need something, but it can't be their game. Can't play DARPA's game. What is that? 
how do we go about this? They would like us to uh, come at them aggressively. It was the art of war, you know, destabilize someone by provoking them and destabilizing them. So what is the opposite? And, and this dandelion thing just came to me. And then now it's, it's that it's, it's um, diffuse. It's sun, and moon, and stars. It's deeply rooted. It has the minerals. It's a liver cleansing. It's got all of these properties to it. And so I said, well, this is it, because how do you have a conversation about these bigger things without being bogged down in a very prescriptive narrative that the mainstream or alternative media want to limit you to? Because once you step into that, everyone's already decided. I'm on this side of the issue. I'm on that side of the issue. You have to break. You have to step out of that issue entirely. So I'm like, well, if we talk about dandelions, I. The, the, I had a, a friend in upstate New York who did a lovely design for me um, that I'm printing on fabric and, and sharing out. I want to do patches, but we had like four slogans, dandelion manifest, um, the revolution will not be tokenized, don't geofence me in, and nature not nano. And none of those things were part of the normal narrative. But if you put it out in the world, people would be like, well, what is geofencing? What, what do you mean tokens? Like, what are you talking about? And then it opens the door to be like, hmm, well, do you know about a digital wallet and a portal and you know behavior credits and things and so that's what i'm learning to trust is my intuition you take it and then you surf you live with it you share with other people because this dandelion idea was something i've had people from all over the world send me dandelions um send me dandelion honey send me i i have this little ring someone sent me it has dandelion um, little seeds on it, like floating. And I didn't ask for things, but I said, if you want to be part of something, we can't all create some alternative village concept. You know, we're not necessarily all in a position of creating alternative currency or something outside this domination, but we can energetically intervene and try to transmute some of this energy, tr transmute some of the egregore, this waveform that's that's not just about this health event, but is about a larger problem of global capital and what it means to be human. Um, send me your dandelions. I don't care what, like I've got boxes of them. I've got some of them are sort of rotten and some of them I've had cards with just a few seeds. I've had like, and they're in my a little rimmed baking sheet on my, and I take them and I took them to New York and I've taken them to Aberdeen and I've taken them places and we just say, you know, um, some of us don't agree to this plan this plan for the planetary computer, some of us are not on board with this. And so we are just stating very clearly because a lot of this, if you understand it from a, you know, I don't go to the esoterics first place. That's not my first place to go. But I do think that there are people who know how to use word spells, use energetics to shape outcomes. And if what they have to do is tell you, and then you have, they have to assume agreement on your part, maybe they presume you agree unless you say you don't agree. Then I go places and say, some of us are not with this. Some of us say no. And who knows what the outcome is on that? I don't know. I can't presume. I'm not trying to tell everybody to do that. But for me, that made sense. And that was an intuitive. That was me listening to the world around me and then energetically connecting through means of communication and alternate means of communication through dandelions with people around the world. And it's felt kind of cool, actually. Um, so. I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to play around to be more playful and listen to the natural world. I think that's where, and in that way, I do think there are unexpected things, but we have choice. Like there are choices to be made. And sometimes people sort of tune everything out and feel like they don't have choices, but we ultimately have responsibility, not for all of the things, but when things are presented to us, how do we respond? And so that's what I'm trying to learn, knowing that we're imperfect. We're not going to all do it right all the time, but to inspond, respond from a place of integrity, not just for protecting myself or my family or my community or just people, but knowing that the decisions made around militarized electronics and frequency systems actually are going to affect the moss's reproductive cycle in the water system. They're, gonna, they're going to affect I spent the July 4th because I'm so like not about July 4th anymore. Like I went to a creek in a park and it was dark with my can. Like just I went down with a candle and a blanket and just to put my feet in the water because I feel like it was out of time, right? I was I was stepping into time really, and it's in the city, but it's a very tucked away dark park forest and um, and I was just looking for guidance. I'm like you know. 
this doesn't feel right. Fireworks don't feel right. This, you know, and, and I don't know what, what I'm doing by myself here. I'm not leading any movement. I'm just me trying to figure shit out. And I, and I, I sat in the water, you know, I sat next to the water. I put my feet in the water and I looked and the lightning bugs, the lightning bugs came and, you know, often these days people don't make time for the lightning bugs. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't. Um, and that was a communication of the universe with me was this lightning bugs, the, the synergy and reflecting on these boulders, these ancient boulders and the lightning bugs that their life is just one or two years. And then so much of what we're living through now is about fear of death and life. And well, what is my life compared to a niece boulder? My life is tiny. What is my life compared to a lightning bug? Well, it's pretty big. It's all relational, right? And so what do you do with the time that you have? How do you, what energy do you put out? And, um, and I guess that's for me why our current understanding of cloud-based technology from a military and increasingly um, programming standpoint, because the technologies are embedded in entertainment, in gaming, and that comes out of, if you understand um, consumer culture, uh, propaganda, uh, MK Ultra, <laughs> all of these things are about using um, visuals and language to message, to convey a message that those who hold the wealth seek to have you absorb and feel like it's your idea, like internalize it. Um, if we turn away from that into a different energetic system, what things can we surface? Like what kind of future do we create in that way? Um, so I don't know, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's a very thorough and deep and uh, uh, good answer with a lot of layers. And we could, we could definitely go to that direction. And I think that's kind of, you are already saying in a way, a part of sort of an answer what you think in a way what you are at least doing and maybe inspire others to do which is to wonder more about the nature i mean i what uh, another thing came to my mind which is this idea that we're literally kind of blocking the stars with uh, i suppose with elon musk's like satellite systems at some part and it's like interesting this idea of do we <laughs> i mean do we want that do we want what, what is it that people want and the people who listen to this what is it that you know if you listen to or watching this what kind of world do you want and then i think it's a very deep question i think we all should definitely consider and then think and base the choices from, from that place i suppose is kind of what you're also saying if i'm understanding yeah. right and and then but it this was a, such a beautiful beautiful answer i think but i would still wanted to touch upon like what do you like, let's say, I'm sure some people might still think, oh, well, okay, MK Ultra. I heard a lot of things that sounded like a conspiracy. Like, what, what are things that you know for a fact are happening today? And you, I know you already touched upon many, but you could kind of simplify maybe and explain what people, in your opinion, should be aware of. Like, is it a crypto? You talked about blockchain. You talked about... Um, you know, token system, geofencing, nano nanotechnology being in our water system. I mean, <laughs> I mean, any one of those subjects I think would be interesting for me to hear, and I'm sure for many. But like, if you would have to pick one to uh, to pick a technology that's already here and that you think people should be aware of, or how it affects, or what it might do, or where it might lead, what 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 would you uh, where would you start? Right. <laughs> well, I think, I think this, one of the key ideas, um, if we go back to this idea of the digital twin mm -hmm. and uh, the metaverse, right? And if we understand that that's an, an empire, right? Then the manifest destiny, right? At least from the US standpoint, you know, there was, um, you know, within the continent, the pressing of the moving towards the West and the erasure of that, which was into a, a Western scientist framing, then the US 
sort of expanded its military empire post-World War II into all of these territories and military bases. We don't consider ourselves an empire, but that was the construct. Then this next phase is an information empire. And that's something my friend Joseph was teaching me about this morning was understanding the universe as information. And um, even our understanding of matter and particle physics are sort of mixed into that, right? That what we a sense of the world is not um, perhaps fully grasped, right? Like how we access it. Um, and there is a, um, Anyway, okay, so, I'll go. so if, we, if we understand the metaverse, and I will, I will share a paper with you that maybe you can link in the bottom to, sure, have sure. to look at, that I've been looking at. Through, so Nippon Telegraph and Telephone um, is, is central in 6G technology and digital twinning. And I, I feel probably closely working in Japan on this moonshot idea. Also SoftBank is one of the largest Japanese banks and they have the world's largest innovation fund around AI. Um, and what is robotics. the moonshot? What is the moonshot idea? Okay. Moonshot. The moonshot oh, shit, moon project shot. is yeah, the moonshot is the Japan Science and Technology Agency, where they said they have a number of goals. But the first one is that by 2050, we exist outside having a physical mind and body in time and space. Okay, and you might think, well, that's just a crackpot idea, except it's coming out of the government of Japan. Um, it's connected with Nippon Telegraph and Telephone, and SoftBank is one of the largest you know, financial institutions in Japan, is running the world's largest AI and robotics, and, and is channeling a lot of the Saudi sovereign wealth fund money. Like, you can't just like be like, oh, you know, and we have particle physicists, and we have these nanoelectronics, and we're looking at like ways of essentially parasitizing the mind with um, nanoparticles, with nanorobotics all framed as dual use, right? Oh, we just want to cure Parkinson's. We just want to help stroke victims. We just want to understand Alzheimer's. But literally all of these ways of engineering cells and neurons as machines, um, it's being done by the military and state intelligence <laughs> operations. They literally look at us as programmable matter, you know? And for us, the masses of people, you know, they, they just think of us as animals that talk. You know, for the most part, it, this is a this is a predatory system masquerading and people need to believe the myth right the people working on the small DNA segment that's going to cure cancer that this is all for good. And not that it's it's about turning us into potential biocomputing batteries piezoelectric energy harvest batteries they don't want to know that part, but so the myth the myth progresses, so if you understand the metaverse you understand that they through all of the digital information that is learning us, both from our physical presence, our facial recognition, our gait analytics, our you know, BMI, the biosensors in us, they're learning our physical body from the outside in and the inside out. They're also aiming to learn our mental function, our um, emotional life through neural interfaces. And it's not just Musk's uh, you know, Neuralink, because I think in many respects, that's a distraction from the use of nanotechnology. Because most people think like, oh, well, I'm not going to go get that surgery. So it's not going to affect me. No, what we're talking about is at the nanoscale and the weaponization of the environment. And a lot of Freeland is, is coming out with a book now on transhumanism and the use of the weaponization of the environment and that but we will we will imbue the environment with particles that then you consume and become integrated into the planetary computer and so we, we we learn you we mirror you in a digital universe and this is happening through um the narrative is around uh personalized medicine uh that you will create a digital twin of yourself using an electronic health record and that we will be able to prototype your chemotherapy treatments or we will be able to do various medical interventions on your digital twin first to make sure it's not going to hurt you. That's the setup, right? So we need your digital twin so we can give you good medicine, right? Um, and again, this is within the, the, the allopathic Rockefeller medicine construct, right? But this is how we're going to build your digital twin. We're gonna, you know, this is being set up by the EU and many other places. Dassault Industries is working on digital twinnings as well with Microsoft and Moderna. We're gonna digitally twin you. We're gonna put you in the metaverse. We're gonna model you. We're not gonna model just you, but we're gonna actually model entire societies 
We're going to model smart cities. The sensor networks of the smart cities are connected to this. And this is all in an NTT white paper that I can share with you. And then there is a second paper where they're theorizing. So if you imagine you've got a hat like that you in the metaverse in a mixed reality, which is what how they talk about it that is mixing augmented reality and digital reality that somewhere in the metaverse is me sitting in this chair talking to you, but a digital version right so i'm steering the digital version I do I move my hands they move their hands okay. Um, the next trick is when the digital twin it's a bi directional okay. So the digital twin moves you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will say this is what they're positing. They say we are interested in coming up with a growth model for the material person based on the action of the digital twin. Okay. So of course they will frame it as wonderful, right? Like you go to sleep, your digital twin learns Italian, you wake up, you know Italian, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's how they will, you know, it's always how they, which, use cases they they choose but i will say increasingly like i have been reached out to by people um who f are being targeted by neurotech weapons and i would say if you look into the work of james giordano who is a professor of bioethics at georgetown university and he has quite a number of talks online at west point to the military um, about the use of neural weapons and and you can look up his name on my Twitter feed i've pulled small clips to for I mean he talks very specifically about neurotech weapons. Um, manipulating minds through frequencies and that it's all dual use he's always talking about dual use right, so we know that the military is pursuing such technologies, they feel like other. Countries are pursuing this technology. We have Japan saying, well, how can we get your digital twin twins experience to reflect back on your physical body. And then we have a group of targeted individuals who are saying, wow, I'm being targeted by electromagnetic weapons. I have, I am experiencing sensor based technologies, potentially nano nanotech technologies linked to drones or satellite systems that no one will believe me. This is the third rail no one can talk about, right? Even though Giordano has pretty much said these weapons are something we are pursuing and they're all dual use. To think that there would not be any non-consensual human experimentation, you know, these are the things I'm trying to surface because um, through optogenetics and now the graphene, they are talking about being able to use cellular technologies and photonics and light and frequency to trigger um, computing programming systems in cells. Again, always framed as on the positive, um, but they, MIT, I believe it was MIT, you can look up, in recent years, they've talked about implanting false memories in mice, mm -hmm. um, that you can, it was something about having them step in a cage that was electrified, and they could implant a signal, a lot of the signal implantation is through fear and trauma. And this was with optogenetics coding of proteins with bioluminescence that were triggered by LED lighting, which at this point is like a, they have like a filament that goes into the brain in a head, head gear, like a printable headgear that they put on the mouse that used to be wired and now it's wireless, but that they can stimulate with light the cells to have this reaction and then put the mouse in another area and trigger it. And even though the thing isn't um, electrified on the bottom, they experience it as though it were. Okay, so this programming at this with mammals, right, is already happening. Um, they've, they've talked about being able to um, electronically with, or I think it's actually also with LED, to socialize mice wirelessly. So to use the programming to have a group of mice and then target two mice for interaction to attract themselves to one another electronically and then to withdraw that stimulation, exterior stimulation and break that connection. Okay, so these are research that is being pursued and I'm, I'm gonna be giving a talk on this in Utica on the weekend, but literally these science, like when we say, oh, all of this technology is just logical and it's all just like wearing eyeglasses. I'm like, no, this is a domination system. If what we're saying is that we can 
potentially weaponize your environment with LED lighting, with um, <clears throat> cellular engineering that you may not be aware of through your environment. And then from remotely be the puppet master of individuals' lives or so social systems, that's a huge problem. And when the bioethicists are essentially talking to West Point and saying, yeah, this is the future. The future is the, the battle space of the future is the mind. The battle space of the future is information. Uh, the battle space of the future is something I would say 99% of the population is not even aware of. Like, how, I mean, how many people on a daily basis do you think walk outside their house and think, oh, I'm imbued in electromagnetic system. Most people don't, they just would never even occur to them. And that's what like when Stephen Newcomb of, he, he has, has a book, Pagans in the Promised Land, and he speaks of when the original people were there, you know, if you picture them and there's this ship sailing in, and he said, there was no way those people could understand what the mind was of the people on the ship. Their worlds were so different, they had no common knowledge. Um, there, they, there was no means of communication because the worldview that was coming was so unlike anything that currently existed in that physical space. And then over time, it became apparent what was happening. And then as the means of communication and understanding became clearer, and then people had a sense of, okay, th this is not good, right? What, 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 what is planned out here is it has significant ramifications. And I, I'm, I'm, to me, it feels like we are at the same point. We are standing on the beach and the nanoelectronics boat is coming in and very few people have any understanding of what it is and those who are maybe would be the ones to be able to interpret are through social conditioning and um, potentially threats, not in a position of telling anyone. And so it's those of us who like, and, and that's what I would say graphene is central to this, the graphene equation. And I know there, there, there are scientists who did the electron microscopy recently who are exposing the uses of graphene in different medical systems and in different um, you know, masks and other things like that, that, is, that science is being done, but it's at great risk because the system is set up to, um, I think a cult to hide knowledges and limit them to access to certain tiers, certain tiers of society. And then generally other people do not have that access because they don't want us to know what is, a, what is coming. So because we might question it, right? We might question, oh, wait a minute. Um, what is the place of optogenetics as you install in your smart cities, all of these um, frequency systems and LED systems? What, how does this interface with what we know, the biotech companies? And this is simply a capitalist paradigm. You know, I've given talks in Salt Lake City and Arizona. Um, Salt Lake City had over a thousand biotech companies. Arizona had 2,500. And I said, listen, guys, like you're investing in these companies because you feel like you're, this is the new economy, right? Is, is, is essentially using the living systems to create profit centers, right? And I said, the only, where are a thousand um, companies in Utah, life sciences companies in Utah going to be profitable? Like the only two options are that the plan is that many, many more people will be chronically ill um, to use these products or that you will create rev revenue streams that have healthy people using these products through augmentation, right? And so either your, your growth imperative is either that there's gonna be more and more and more and more and more sick people, or that you are going to find a way to make people who otherwise would not need your product, use your product. And I, I believe that that is the biosecurity state and the, con and the, the biometric tracking systems. Are you upgraded on your product, right? It, 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 and no one is stopping to say, maybe we should not make economy based on this. Because if we go forward 20 years, that will essentially mean that we become subdued to the system. And who, who is at the top of the system? Who is actually running the biotech computing system? Yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can you define a little bit what, what is optogenetics? And, and maybe also like what is considered nanotechnology or nanobots and, and where or it's already used and you, you mentioned like, do you, are, are you saying that it can be already in the water system or people drink it or people eat it or, or, or what? 
Yeah. So I would say like, and this is all a huge education for me too. So like what I, I say is like, I'm, I'm a mom. I got into this because they closed my school in, in this, my city. Uh, right? And, and so that, that's how I came into this. Literally in 2013, they closed a bunch of schools and I'm like, mm. this isn't fair. And, you know, I just kept following money and power. Right. And I, I had some awakenings to the structure and nature of power, but my background is in art history and historic preservation and cultural landscapes. So I don't claim to be an expert on biotechnology. I don't claim to be an expert on blockchain. I don't claim to be, but I am an interested um, interrogator of the systems. And I, I, I welcome collective, good faith collective um, examination, right? So that's sort of where I'm at. And that is what, for the most part, the current education system doesn't want. They don't want curious thinkers who go out of their lane. Because if you're a curious thinker who goes out of your lane, you might be able to start connecting the dots, which is, I think, what my skill set brings to this conversation is that I'm, I go wide and I, I, I synthesize things, um, but I'm always willing to be wrong. Because believe me, this is not something that I would take any satisfaction in being right about. Like if someone could actually convince me clearly that none of this was going to end up in a planetary computer where we are no longer in control of our thoughts or our bodies. Like I'd be cool with that, right? If someone could show me where the, 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 the guardrails are on this to make sure that that never happens. But you know, if you understand Operation Paperclip and the Nazis and science, like, I don't know, like it's, there's some concerning things. So, um, so <laughs> you know, like if, you know, it, it puts the whole space program in a very different understanding if you understand Operation Paperclip, it's very, very different. Um, which again, look it up. I mean, it's the CIA open records. It's, you know, it's not hidden. Yeah, I, no I, I will promote. There was a one episode I did with uh, one guy here in Finland uh, with Slim Mill. And uh, we actually talked about it. I, I even showed the book on from my bookshelf um, back. Yeah, in, in I mean, the, and there's uh, a lot in Latin America, actually. Like I, I have a friend who's written a book on like the nano mafia in Latin America. So there's mm. a lot, it's not just the United States, it's the nano. Um, so. The nano, the idea, and I'm learning all of this. So like, bear with me if I get some things wrong, but I think his name is it Richard Feynman, F-E-Y-M-A-N. In the late fifties, I believe he had a lecture that said, um, there's plenty of room at the bottom. So the, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And so what he was theorizing was a change. He was a physicist and that if you could understand things at the molecular level like the world would completely change that you could re-engineer the world and manifest it this is at the scale of an electron microscope so no, that's something that is beyond our current ability to perceive in the material world but if you could access that molecular world and rebuild things molecule by molecule to the point that they would manifest in the real world, that that would change everything. So this isn't brand new. This, the, the theory goes back, you know, 50 plus years. So then people have been working on this forever, but they don't have the technology. They didn't have the electron microscopes. And even if you did, the idea of putting little molecules next to each other into machines was still, they didn't have the manufacturing capability to do that. Um, and I still don't quite get it how it happens because I don't understand how you make a nano machine that isn't visible and get it to where it needs to go. Like, and this is often framed as precision medicine or other things, but I still like, you, you put it in a jar, you can't put it in a box and ship it through UPS. Like what exactly does that look like? Surely they know, but like, I've never seen it exactly. So, but this is the way they talk about is nano fabrication. And there's a really, an interesting book, um, called uh, The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, who's a science fiction writer, and he wrote it in 1995. And I would, it's a bit dry and a bit thick. To, it took me a couple times to really get into it, but I'm telling you, in 1995, he knew all the things. Like he was talking nanobots, he was talking about tablet-based um, uh, information systems, he was talking about 3D dots and uh, motion capture and globalist paradigms and frequency systems and, you know, uh, matter compilers and all of these things in 1995. So if you're in the know, if you're in the groups who know, you know, and it's not a surprise. If you're in the groups who aren't supposed to know, it's all sounds very shocking. And then Neil Stevenson actually became the head futurist for Magic Leap Virtual Reality, 
which I think he is no longer that, but, but that was, he worked with Bezos for a while and Magic Leap VR. So the, again, that's the empire, right? That's the empire that's being redesigned by the military at a molecular level. So they've been building on this idea of nanoparticles. Now there are natural nanoparticles in the atmosphere, and then there are engineered nanoparticles. And um, I have a friend who does a lot more work in this, and I would highly recommend checking out. She is one of the bloggers at a, a blog called A Piece of Mindful, piece like a piece of the puzzle, a piece of mindful. And her um, articles are under Steffers, is, is her blogging name. Um, and she actually has a really important piece called, I think it's Memoir of an Engineered Nanoparticle, an ENP. And so she talks about um, the role of engineered nanoparticles in nanomachines and crossing the blood brain barrier and getting into the mind. Because really what the predator, in my mind, the predator energy wants is to understand who is the programmer? Who is the programmer of the universe? And this is a conversation I was having with my friend Joseph at the moment that this, these information communication systems are top down and that communication has to have a transmitter and a receiver and a commonly understood language. And the people at the tippy top, if you understand even DNA as is a communication system, who decided what the symbols meant? That, that you can't have communication before both parties understand the symbols, whether that's uh, Morse code, smoke signals, alphabets, like, you know, I've encoded dandelion with this message. So when someone gives you a dandelion, you will know it means this or do this action. That there has to be, if you've got the transmitter and receiver and the language, the language, the, the symbols, the, the mode of extracting the message has to pre-exist the two parties. So where does that come from? And they want to know that because what they're doing now is they're messing around with the computing system but they don't know how to be the ones at the tippy top. They don't know how to be get to the top. Their goal, like the predator energy wants to claim the coding system from whoever is currently at the top setting the communication signals. And so that is this quest of empire. And if like it keeps unfolding like an onion. So the other piece, I, which is my research, which I haven't even talked about at all is, um, this idea of social impact investing and that we will use um, the sustainable development goals to create the interplanetary computer and to say we're going to track all of your behavior against the environment and put sensors on all the trees so that we can track climate, you know, carbon credits for uh, BlackRock and Blackstone and these, the global impact management project. So to get the digital twinning to happen, they they've they've framed everything as sustainable but it's not sustainable but they framed it like the sustainable we have to live in nanotech world so that blackrock can make money off of our behavior and, and nature's behavior and the engineered behavior and we so we can engineer your behavior by the way all that sensor data is feeding the singularity and that's what singularity net is with ben gertzel and that's what the blockchain system is going to keep track of all of this on the ultimate ledger the ledger system, which goes back to the papal bulls and double entry bookkeeping. The new ledger is the blockchain, okay? So all of your energetic impulses, whether they be your good behavior, your electronic health record, your education credentials, everything is fed onto the blockchain so they can in turn give it to AI because they're the Ben Gertzel wants the singularity and handsome robotics. They want that, they're putting 5 million kids, Cardano's putting 5 million kids on blockchain in Ethiopia with, with Ben Gertzel and Hanson robotics to Feed that singularity, baby. Put on that virtual headset. Let's plug in your pineal gland and feed it into the system, right? And so you've got impact, you, you've got climate crisis, you know, which does not take into account the military at all in climate crisis. Um, you've got biosecurity state, you know, we're under a perceptual pandemic. Everybody put on your sensors. Everybody get logged in the blockchain so we can track you as an individual in social systems. We're making our butt bets. The hedge funds are making the bets on playing off again the markets, the futures markets and climate and water and people's behavior. Meanwhile, all the data feeds to AI. It's feeding into the digital twins in the metaverse. And then once you're in the metaverse, then the end goal is like they're trying to get to the top tier of how the f do we program this? Who's the programmer and how do we swap places?
So like to me, that's the point where I'm at now. And the mechanism is both the tracking systems, the biosensor systems, which are inherent in creating a ubiquitous sensing environment, a sensed environment that is foundation in electronics, which must be imbued with nanoparticles for the frequency systems. And so right now it's in everything. And, and, and once, like, and when once you, uh, and once you, <laughs> once that, uh, well, you call it the predator energy, once that has figured out how to basically code life, you think that's when uh, uh, these uh, capsules of babies will be born and, uh, and they will be automatically just uh, uh, programmed uh, with this kind of uh, uh, AI to do certain jobs that uh, whatever the predator energy wants you to do. Well, and I think, I mean, the other piece of this, and I will credit Sophia Smallstorm on this, who, who's very, who she alerted me, but the more I understand this is another big piece is so when I was doing um, human capital finance, so that's really what I was doing really hard, like six to eight months ago, like leading into, um, you know, last March, I'm like, my focus was, okay, they want to put sensors, they want to put digital identity blockchain, they want to do all this stuff, and it's for global hedge funds. And, you know, that's the game. The game is about human capital finance and tracking people, controlling society as they shift to this world of automation, and it's all going to be this. And then, and then increasingly, so goal four is education. Goal three is sustainable development goal. Three is health, so that's your digital twin. Four is education, because they both want the predator energy, um, what you know, because you're training your replacement, remember, like through the sensors, you're training your replacement. And then increasingly in education, the emphasis is on social emotional learning and the whole child. So they want to start creating badges and rubrics for emotion and proper behavior. Because again, you're training a replacement, you're humanizing AI. So they're using the children to, for the data extraction to train the AI. And I think in some respects, children and even babies they're working on babies now with this lena um listening device to listen to how families talk to their children and putting sensors called lena um in their onesies so like electro electrifying the children because ai needs to start at baby steps right like if you if you tried to plug the ai into my brain at this point it would probably be like, you know like it doesn't it's too much right i'm too all over the place but you give it to a baby and then you give it to a toddler and then you give it to a young kid, like it learns, you're, it's learning with this. So like babies and old people, they're kind of pulling that data. And that's also an elder care monitoring. So they're pulling the data in um, and, and go for an education. I was like, they need the kids to code it. The metaverse doesn't fully exist. I mean, it exists in bits and pieces. It exists in Fortnite, it exists in Twitch, it exists in Zoom. Um, it exists, you know, in the um, whatever Purdue's the sentient world simulation. It exists in a lot of different places, but it's not cohesive at this point. And and to me, like that, that's the portals of the spatial web. And I think Adobe is a big piece of this, like porting and access and file compression. Like the metaverse exists in innumerable files, right? And who has access to what files, right? And that's your wallet. That's your digital wallet, right? Can you port? to that version of place in the metaverse. Um, you know, and I will say the porting, if you understand that almost as space travel, right? You're traveling across time and space when you port in the metaverse. Um, Joe Licklider from MIT, who was like one of the fathers of the ARPANET and was in acoustics and behavioral psychology um, and the computing. In 1963, he wrote a letter that predated the creation of the ARPANET, but to members of the intergalactic network. That's the name of the memo, the inter, like to the members of the intergalactic network, right? And so, and that, they don't just joke around about that, right? So if they're imagining space, like what if space already exists as electric frequencies, right? And now what we're doing is the space that exists as we understand it here on the earth is packets of rooms and experiences and gamified environments that live as files that are like 
saved in compression that can be uncompressed as, as needed and then recompressed and that you're an avatar, maybe we're already <laughs> avatars, like accessing different files in the system and living through different realities in the system. Like that's, it's kind of crazy, but Adobe, like Silicon Slopes, a lot of this is Salt Lake City and Adobe was a key player in Silicon Slopes, which sits opposite the NSA data center at Bluffdale. Like your digital twin could totally live at Bluffdale already. You have to go under the building of Adobe to get into like, it's not a gated community, but their ceremonial entrance to Silicon Slopes is under, under the Adobe building. Like they built out over the road. So you would literally go under the Adobe building to get, which is interesting if you think about Adobe because that's nature, that's a natural soil and they've co-opted it to electric, right? Like, cause these word plays are very interesting. Um, anyway, I, 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 I digress, but where was I? Go? But I think like this is this is this metaverse, right? And and so they want the kids. They 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 want to learn them. They need to code them. Oh, the piezoelectric. But then once you build it, it has to be powered, which is this crazy matrix battery situation. So if you look up piezoelectric human energy harvest, like which some of the papers are actually out of Transylvania University, which is crazy. But they are talking about nano wires on like your eyelids, on your throat, even like implanted in your veins so that your life force, the micro micron movements become harvested. Initially they say for wearable technology, your wearable technology, but that your life force is literally being mined for that. And the nanotech and the smart environments, they're talking about like in India tiles that have embedded nanotech. So when you walk on them, it creates energy that's then also captured. So if you picture the ready player one scenario where you're living in a stacked freight container um, and they hand you, you know, your, uh, you know, a haptic suit, your smart haptic suit, and you're trapped in there and with your, you know, screen based virtual reality existence, you just, you know, there you're sitting in, you are become a battery for the system, both your intellectual and emotional labor that is being pulled, but your uh, biodynamic energy that's created as you, your bodily functions get micro harvested into running the metaverse, which I think will all be tracked on blockchain, which is kind of crazy. But I think, I mean, I think that's how the pieces go together. Wow. Yeah, that's super interesting. There's so much, so much to unpack on all, all, all of these ideas. Uh, what, what are some uh, resources that you usually go to? You mentioned the many books and authors and uh, colleagues of yours already, but uh, yeah. what, what kind of, were, were there some books, some lectures that kind of started you on this path? You said 2013, so, uh, you started uh, go, go into researching uh, how the world works and, uh, yeah. but do, do you have some, uh, maybe reading that you recommend mostly to people who want to understand, I don't know. Is like, I think if you get a book deal and you are known, it's because you, you're supposed to, you know what I mean? Like if you go on tour, if you're Shoshana Zuboff and you're going around selling surveillance capitalism and everyone's like, yeah, tell me more, tell me more. Like you're there because you are not a threat to the system. Mm. Um, it is what it is, right? Like she's hanging out with Kevin Werbach at Wharton. Um, and yeah, the, the, so I, for me, um, most of my work is reading their white papers and just mm. reading what they say their plan is and believing them. Because I think for the most part, if you are someone who's in academia, um, your credentialing is reinforcing the knowledge base of other academics which are in turn, uh, you know, there, there, there's little incentive to go to, to tip the apple cart, right? Because you are credentialed within the kingdom, <laughs> you know, you know, the, the academic kingdom grants you your, your, um, you know, rights to go to conferences and, and, you know, wine and cheese hours and various things. And so you're going to do what you need to do. And, and if someone says, oh, look over here, like I've corresponded with people who have written fancy books about this, um, who, will make an initial inquiry and then just stop. Um, so I think there's a certain degree that people who have a position can't go there. Now, again, I'm doing this because I'm a mom. 
I wandered into this. I think I've been put in places to see these pieces. I'm in a city that's embedded in this, that is embedded in Wharton Business School with ENIAC, the first computer, with the impact investing scheme, with the Center for Behavioral Health Economics. I can see these things and I know ethically my job is to say this isn't okay. I say this is not okay and I say we need to have a damn big conversation around it before this happens because knowing what I know of history, um, this is a, a this is going to be a dominating system that will reinforce very bad things for the world to the point of potentially eliminating natural life. And so whatever it is, I don't make money on my channels. I, I'm not castigating people who do, but it's a different model. I'm supposed to do this thing and I'm finding other people who are also on the same wavelength, so to speak, who are also doing the same thing. And so I, I would just say, look at my material and see if it makes sense to you. Follow my links, look up, like we're in Google, right? All the terms that I use, you go look them up and see what you think about them, right? You go look up piezoelectric human energy harvest out of Transylvania and see what you think about it, right? Like, and then you make up your own idea. And then once you have your idea, then we can have more robust conversations about it, right? But um, so I look at LinkedIn profiles. I look at their white papers. I look at the grants. I map the money because they don't hide what they're doing. They just presume no one who would oppose it would, would pay any attention or if they did encounter that they would matter. And to me, I think if you understand this engagement as a sacred engagement that is happening potentially at a waveform level or a particle level, it's not a numbers game. It's, it's not a game of millions of people. It is in the program, the top-down program, whether that, you know, maybe is that program God, you know? When those who are given the task, when they are presented with the choice, do they make the right choice, right? Like it's a, it's a binary, like there's a choice and what choice do you make, right? It's, and to me that is, what is coming is grounded in faith, like, and not a one world religion faith, but the faith of all of the people who on their lands and in their culture practice outside of corrupted institutions have a faith with a higher consciousness being God, how that represents to do the right thing. And I think that's the test. I think that there are tests being made. And I don't mean to say that I'm like have some giant ego that I can't explain it otherwise, because if you're like, Allison, by the way, you have to, like when I was doing this work, I'm like, okay, so um, this is about the CIA. This is about Mossad. This is about the Vatican. This is about SoftBank. This is about Alibaba, like how uh, Saudi sovereign wealth fund, how many bigger things can I go up against to interrogate the system? That's a lot. When I, when they closed their Boston consulting group, closed these schools in Philadelphia, I did not know that that's where it's going to go, but that's where it went. And so what are, what are my tools? I don't play their game. I'm stepping out of their game. If there's plenty of room at the bottom, as Feynman said, I'm going to find the space in between the particles to try to affect the waveform in the way I can do it. And it may not take that many. It's like the morphic field or the morphic resonance. It could just be there's enough of us who can disrupt the egregore. And, I, and I, I'm not saying, like, I never came from like woo-woo stuff or new age stuff or meditation stuff. Literally, I'm just a regular person. But my intuition says the answer isn't in their game. And the answer is following our own connection to natural life and understanding at an, at an atomic level, something very, very tiny could be incredibly powerful. That's what nanotech teaches us. The nanoparticles are so powerful because the normal rules of physics don't apply and um, unexpected things can happen. So um, I think my friend Joseph wrote a beautiful guest post on my blog about love and math because that is his gift and about love extending into the universe as light and that you can't hold, hold light, you have to pass it. And if you hold light, it creates a black hole. And so that the, there's this universal energetic system of light that is you capture it and then you pass it, you capture it and you pass it. And so if we understand, maybe it's not the internet, but it's the Indra's net, this, this, this web of the universe with the beautiful jewel hanging at every intersection, reflecting all of the beauty that that is exists in equal reality to the militarized internet. And so how do we access that? How do we access that part? 
and I don't know, I don't say I have all the answers for sure, but I'm, I'm hoping to ask enough questions or to hold space for there to be other possibilities that the other people who do know who feel the same might be able to contribute their gifts and we can figure it out. Well, wow, that's a beautiful and poet poetic. Um, uh, I, I think I think that could be maybe a good good place to kind of wrap up. Uh, I think that can leave to a lot of people to interpret and think that message on their own way. Maybe you can still uh, say where where people can find you. Uh, you have your uh, blog, friendsinthegears.com. I will, of course uh have all the links and everything else all the other resources i will try to find all the books and uh, put it in the show notes wherever people yeah. watch, watch or listen to this uh do you have any any other people are you in social media uh, in, in anywhere yeah, or, I, mean, or? So, <laughs> I mean i i i currently have a youtube channel that has two strikes on it now so mm. i don't know i'm looking if anybody has ideas i don't really want to put it on blockchain uh, obviously so i'm trying to figure out what that looks like if people have thoughts um and again i'm not i'm not monetizing any of it it's, but allison mcdowell youtube you can find for now and um so i'm on twitter my twitter handle is philly philly 852 and then on facebook it's Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, Hover, H-A-W-B-E-R, McDowell. Um, most of my, all my posts are public. And um, yeah, we're just trying to, like walking this road as, as overwhelming as this past year has been, has been so amazing to like understand, learning and revisiting new ways about, the, it's dynamic. And the, the people, like, I think a lot of, if you get caught in the darkness and the fear, it's overwhelming. And so I think what I can do is look at it in a, um, a more objective way and play with it, like play with the puzzle pieces, try, does this fit, does this fit? And not to be so overwhelmed and to know that like life is on our side, love is on the side, like we just have to step up. And, and so there is this beautiful community that's out there. Um, and I do think that people who are technologists um, like I said, my, my friend Joseph has so many gifts who is, who's taught all of us about um, electrical communications. I'm not here to disparage people whose gifts those are. I, I, I agree and, and much of the world now is built around those enterprises. So if we understand this is like the sacred versus a profane, a military versus a nature, um, help me understand it better because um, they're, they're, they're very well, I'm still totally learning many, many things. And I don't say that I have all of the knowledge or all the answers. Yeah, uh, there is actually, actually, I, I want to also ask you, did, did you know why YouTube strike you? Did you, because uh, YouTube strike me, I think one or two times already also, it was because of this yeah. uh, current, uh, current world thing. And uh, one of my guests, or according to you, YouTube was giving medical misinformation. So that was, yeah, that was that's where, usually where, the thing. Mm. I mean, it's, so what the thing I will say is like YouTube is owned by Google Alphabet, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, there's something that would be worth putting on, on as a link. It's called the, the selfish, the selfish ledger, I think the selfish mm. ledger. And it was like a thought experiment put out by Google, like a, a future of um, essentially encapsulating someone's life um, on blockchain for this uploaded consciousness. And I, I actually mapped out all of the concepts in this. So if you understand that um, like Google Alphabet, like when you say the predator energy, I don't think you could hang it on any, you have to understand it as a system. And if you try to pin it on any one just small group of people, you're missing the point. The point is like, we are like living through this collective centuries of trauma and healing that has to happen, but not in a woke like blockchain sensor, social credit behavior way, but like literally an integral processing of, 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 collective trauma in in the world and so like google is looking to harness this stuff through in, you know injections nanoparticles electrofrequency to know you to know like and i have a whole paper about blockchain brains by this person melanie swan to really get your consciousness to feed it into the system and so like clearly if you start to question the mechanisms by which 
they are implementing this larger electronic warfare program, then, then you get a strike. So this was a panel discussion, actually, you had someone who speaks more directly about it than myself. Like you can see even in this whole conversation, like I, I can talk around it and everybody knows what I'm talking about. Most of the stuff I talk about, probably soon, I will, this will all be off limits too. You're not allowed to talk about metaverse digital twinning, but so far so good, like we can still talk about it. And so it was up on, on a colleague's channel and I waited because they didn't have any strikes and it was fine. And then I posted it on mine and then they pulled it down. It was a panel about India um, mm -hmm. and what was happening with the farmers protests in India. So yeah. Um, but they, they don't want questions. I think mm. that's the thing. And, and um, yeah. Um, I did have a one kind of bonus question that came to mind. What, what do you think of, because uh, I know I have some, <laughs> at least I'm quite a few who was following cryptocurrencies and crypto world. Uh, so uh, what, is uh, Bitcoin good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, given the context of all of our conversation, that the digital twin metaverse runs on your blockchain wallet, right? That's, mm -hmm. they want you to imagine it as a wallet, but it's the portal to the metaverse. And so I think the, those, the powers that be would like to, they shape the narrative to the way that is convenient to them. And so right now, if they can speak not about the spatial web and electronic health records and digital brains and um, you know cell therapies and things that would also be attached to distributed ledger systems and just make it about money at a time when people are really fearful because fear is a powerful weapon and offer that and to get buy-in to the system um, you know clearly that's a, strat a good strategy for them. And it seems to be largely working. I'm one of the few people that's like, but wait a minute, it's not actually crypto. <laughs> this is about something much, much bigger. And I would say like, pay attention because if the people who are offering this are not equally spending as much time talking about the ethics of the spatial web and the metaverse and uh, nanoelectronics and, you know, these other, you know, uh, biotech, uh, electronic health record elements, if they're not surfacing that piece of it too, then I would question what is the motivation. If what they want to say is like, we're going to compartmentalize it, we're only going to talk about a financial element over here, we're not going to talk about like the way deeper aspects of um, what it means to engage with token economics with machines, which is what Melanie Swan has, has you know, talked about like in great detail. Um, I'm then to me, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that that's, that indicates not a robust level of engagement with the, the larger questions that I'm interested in. So I usually just block people <laughs> and move on because I'm not here to fight with you. Everybody wants me to debate about it. And I'm like, I don't really want to de debate about the, because I, you're not going to change my position, the understanding as the portal to the metaverse and that it is a, a portal to a militarized space that not enough people actually understand what's going on with it. Um, maybe we will get there, you know, maybe we will get to the point that um, we will get there. But I, I also say my friend who does energy work, and if you understand language, right, currency, currency is a current, it's electronic, it's a hold, right? Even the idea of money is when you have currency that you're engaged in the existing system, right? You're in the kingdom, you have the currency, you're part of the, you're working in the kingdom. And so you, you have your freedom of your currency within the kingdom's constraints. Um, I think even more powerfully with digital currency, whether that's on blockchain or some other space, then you actually add a literal current to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you understand um, the idea of programming matter and um, frequency program and intention setting, once you can get someone to hold currency, um, then it becomes much more difficult for them to let it go. Um, and the, and I, I say this knowing that there are many good people that I care about who are in this space who are, are holding that. And I'm not here to say that you're bad people, but what I'm saying is that this is a system of predator energy who knows exactly what it's doing. And, um, you know, I, I think that there are energetic holds that come along with digital currency that make it harder to have the full conversation. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think uh, what I'm hearing is that you are more for the Dandelion uh, money system. Is, is, is the what revolution I'm will not be tokenized. We're yeah, not turning that, it into 
<laughs> well, see, can I say one last thing? So this is, yeah, of course. And this is like when I say I get put into places, like, and I'm not saying this from the ego. I don't know why this stuff is happening to me. Like, literally, I feel like I'm living in a different world than most people that I'm intimately connected with in person, which is hard. It's hard to have walked out of the cave, you know, as Tom Cowan has a lovely piece about walking out of Plato's cave. And then when you come back in, they say, your brain doesn't work anymore. You don't fit in here anymore. So I've somehow I wandered out of the cave, like not like I was pull, following the LinkedIn's and then I want, oh, well, well, I'm out of the cave. And then I can't quite figure this out. But so one of the last summer I spent, I had the, the gift of spending time on Lakota land in South Dakota. And the things I got out of it were not necessarily the things I expected to get out of it, but a lot of it was time on this particular landscape, which has, um, you know, in the Moreau va Valley. And, um, and I was able to attend a, a ceremony there, um, which was very small because of the nature of the borders being closed and was a guest and uh, you know a guest largely unknown right and the generosity that was was shown to me from a space of of in sacred ceremony and there was a giveaway and in this this um and these in the lakota i you know i think part of their cultural identity is the star people right so there is already a cosmic relationality there that surpasses anything that is part of these you know satellite constellations these web these scientists reconstructions of the, the cosmos. And, um, and so that this gift like went on for hours, you know, into the night in this, in this bend of this river valley and, um, and the children were playing in, in the trees and, and it was just beautiful, the, the, the generosity, right, of, of people who on a material, on a, on a bookkeeping system would be perceived of by outsiders as being, um, you know, not having the material resources that that we imagine are what what how we create standards in the west um but they had they gave they gave and gave and gave and, and they gave many star quilts right there the, the stars and and they gave things to me you know they didn't even know me you know they gave me like you know, they were like little little toiletry bag like soap and you know things and and then i got a a, a small uh little bag of sage and also um a piece of square fabric of um, quilting fabric, which I actually quilt um, too. And so and I think that's also modern, like putting these, all these pieces together. And it was the cosmos. It literally, I had a fat square piece of black fabric with galaxies on it. And to me, that level of exchange in which people are engaged in a reciprocity that acknowledges spirit and community and ties to one another beyond some specific tokenized amount, but that is more holistic, is the direction that feels like what is needed in rebalancing this, this cosmic system, right? And that to me, the blockchain ledger is the antithesis of that because it is reframing trust as a machine and something where, um, now, can I understand how one would scale a gift economy and, and tied to sacred practice? I can't, like I don't, and I, I, I'm not an economist, but to me in my heart, that exchange was a very direct contrast to what is being proposed as liberation right now. And um, I just wanna put that out for the world because that is the thing that the predator energy most wants to erase out of the world is that it is the um, collective connection that is shared in energy of gifts not sought. Like I said, now I, I part of my pay it forward is to, to not, you know, try to um, misuse that, that experience, but to say there is another way. Maybe what I was supposed to do is say there is a different way. Um, not that it's easy, but that we should be examining all the options and that, that there's something quite beautiful in the connections of that, that exchange, that the nature of that exchange in community. Well, Alison, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's a, uh, that's a good place to also stop again. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's, 
it's good. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't have any timeline on this, and uh, I just kind of yeah. go with the intuition. So, and uh, I know you probably have. A, you're starting the day over there, so I will uh, le let you go with your things. Uh, yeah. Do you have any 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 last things to say? Any last messages for people? Any maybe maybe asks of of anybody who's listening to this or or watching? Uh, any any. Well, I would say like try to examine the system. I would say it's like a new language and it's hard. It's, and um, people ask me, I think some people think that I'm doing it on purpose to be complicated or obscure things and I don't. I can just do it the way I do it. I'm not, wasn't trained to do it. And, um, and it's like learning. And so if, if this sounds intriguing, but you, you're frustrated, I, I do still have these videos. People are like, I had to listen to like 20 to 40 hours of your videos and now I get it. Now I really get it. And then they can take, I, you know, maybe at some point the nanotech would just have a mind meld, which is not what I want, but um, I would say stick with it. And then just the, the place of love, like the, if we understand this universe as a place like not just corny love and light, but that there is a frequency of love that we can put our intentions out, that we are powerful. Don't, I, I'm not saying any of this as a fate accompli or that they have got this in the bag or that they'll be able to scale it. I'm saying this is the mindset of the invaders. The mindset of the invaders is this. Um, we are powerful and then how do we choose to engage? And I would say seek clarity, um, come from a place of love and come from a place of healing past injustice and with both our relation to the earth and our relationship to one another. And then through that, like this could be the moment, like there could be these amazing things that come out of it. So anyway, just thanks. Thanks for your time. Take some, da you can send me some dandelions. If you look up on my blog, Dandelion Manifest, my address is here. Don't put it on the customs because they'll take them, but you know, just budget or something, send some seeds and, 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 and take dandelions where you are. Um, it doesn't have to be the flowers, even just the leaves there on all six continents and find a place that sets an intention. I, I talked with someone who's a musician, put your vibration on the world in a good way. And, um, and, and, and we're connected, we're connected through the waves and we're connected through the water and you're not alone. So go team life. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no matter what people think, I think everybody can agree that we we can have and benefit from more love and uh, more more caring in, in this world. Thank you very much for joining my podcast. Make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you like the episode, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Do join our conversations and comment and share these videos forward. Thank you once again and see you on the next episode.